I see. Yeah. Hmm. Distinguished speakers, esteemed delegates, and participants. A very good evening to all. On behalf of Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, mighty in short, Government of India, I am Dr. B K Murthy, Senior Director and Group Head for R and D and IT, mighty. You are host for this session on collaboration for data-driven research and decision making. We have two parts in this session. One is a keynote speeches of three keynote speeches, and there is a panel discussion. You you may be aware that data is now nowadays termed as a new fuel of the digital economy. With the recent technological advancements in data science, data analysis, analytics, and data visualization, etc., data-driven decision making has become crucial for most of the business operations and markets research. It uses past information for future predictions and also to get insights into the consumers' sentiments, purchasing power, past consumptions, additional requirements, if any. These applications spread over various domains such as healthcare education manufacturing transportation energy etc major portion of the consumers data customers data is also important for multiple business entities thus collaboration is essential as the user now now prefers to have one stop solution for all this keeping this in view mighty has notified an open api policy in july 2015 with an objective to develop an open and interoperable platform and enable seamless de service delivery across government silos the national digital highway platform promotes safe and reliable sharing of information and data across various e governance applications the features include interalia api directory api gateway and api management portal this This platform acts as a bridge between API customers and and API providers. Mighty also orchestrated for PDV Personal Data Protection Bill, which is now tabled in the Parliament. With this backdrop, it is my great privilege to introduce the key speakers of this day. Professor Ashutosh Sharma is the Secretary, Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, since to January 2015. where he initiated several new programs related to innovation and startups r&d in advanced manufacturing waste processing clean energy and cyber physical systems industry academia and cooperation science communication women scientists and major international collaborations professor sharma received his phd from sunny buffalo 1988 his research contributions in nanotechnology thin for polymer polymer films nano composites etc resulted in over 350 papers over 15 patents and mentored a nanotechnology startup awards of professor sharma include the inaugural infosys prize in engineering and computer science tawas uh, science prize of the world academy of sciences academy of sciences bessel research award for the, of the humboldt foundation jc bose fellowship santosh sharup batnagar prize homi baba award of ugc Syed Hussain Jahir Medal and the Meghan Meghanand Meghnad Saha Medal of INSA Indian National Science Academy to mention a few Professor Sharma please Thank you Dr Murthy um I'm so happy that MIT has put together this uh, great conference uh, the great summit and we are talking about a very important area which is collaboration for data driven research and decision making now i must say up front that i am not a data scientist and um i usually work with with my natural intelligence rather than artificial intelligence and i don't really know very much about the stuff that you are discussing so why am i here well i am here because um you, you see my department department of science and technology supports and funds a lot of research which generates which creates lot of data uh, arm load of data uh, tons of data uh, and so basically you have money going in and data coming out now you also would want to do the reverse which is let's take this data and create new opportunities create more money uh, if you would uh, so this is the reverse transformation of data that i have interest in now of course data is the base of pyramid uh, for the entire knowledge ecosystem 
So measurements and data uh, would, would transform into information and knowledge uh, and decision making and innovation and governance and everything else. So, so data, as was pointed out by my friend, Dr. Murthy, it, it was called data is the new oil. I heard that many times. Now he, he said data is a fuel for a new economy, but fuel is a little bit abstract. I mean, uh, okay, today fuel is oil and then it would be solar energy or something. So we can't keep changing this. Actually, uh, I keep telling people and they all laugh. So I tell them data is the new water uh, because oil is, uh, is neither that important going in the future, not very, in, uh, it's dispensable uh, and certainly it's not sustainable. But water is something that we certainly is essential and is going to get scarce uh, and it is, it's, uh, it's forever. Uh, so uh, to bring in the importance both of data and water together, something cyber, something physical that we want to bring together. Uh, so also Dr. Murthy uh, talked about a new mission that we launched on cyber physical systems, uh, uh, which includes data analysis. Uh, it includes artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, industry 4.0, IoT, uh, and all the usual suspects, uh, which are um, uh, applied in many sectors like health, water, energy, education, uh, transport, uh, networks of different kinds, um, um, uh, autonomous vehicles, and so on. You get the idea. Uh, this uh, this uh, program is worth about half a billion dollars, uh, and in purchase power parity, uh, it translates into $1.5 billion. So clearly this is a good investment for the future. And so one would want that the, the base layer of this uh, program, which is data, uh, should be robust. Uh, and so we have interest in looking at different aspects of journey of data. Uh, so data creation, uh, measurements for creating data, acquisition of data, a diffusion and dissemination of data, sharing of data, curation of data, formatting of data, flow of data, manipulation of data to build something useful on it, uh, storage of data, localization of data, ownership of data, buying, selling of data, um, visualization of data, um, and, and portability of data, and of course, going to destruction of data. So these are the different aspects of data uh, that uh, this uh, program uh, wants to focus on, uh, both in terms of uh, the scientific aspects and the policy aspects, especially of scientific data that comes out uh, by support of government departments, uh, of uh, the, the, the public uh, support uh, for research. So clearly, um, uh, data is, is clearly related to the new world of Industry 4.0, IoT, uh, AR, VR, communication, computing. So clearly the future is all about convergence of these technologies. It's not about one aspect. It's not only about data. Data is a, is, is a core uh, part of it. Uh, basically, convergence of technologies, especially convergence of technologies in physical cyber and digital domain, and also now rapidly progressing uh, to also including the biological uh, and the life in it. And so I suspect that that would be industry 6.0 uh, is, is the convergence of, of, of uh, cyber physical with the biological. Things are happening at a great speed there, uh, which makes for new challenges uh, in, uh, in this whole uh, uh, triple helix uh, if you would, of cyber, physical, and biological. Uh, so, well, okay, we will deal with it when it comes in the future. But at the moment, the convergence of technologies uh, is in materials, in devices, in communication, in perception through sensors that collect data. And of course, uh, the data which is already out there uh, has to be communicated with speed and in critical applications communicated 
uh, with low latency and so on with the stability. Uh, and also the convergence of decision making based on that big data uh, and the convergence of autonomous action. So if you would, basically you're going an integration of communication, computing, and that's all based on data and decision making, which is based on evidence and data uh, and then perception and action. So pretty much everything that happens in the future is based on this convergence. And so it is very, uh, is very important that we, while we look at the silos of data and then we look at silos of materials and devices and decision-making uh, and we, we do all of that, of course, separately because we have experts in all of these areas, it's equally vital that we also have a convergence of people with different skills and different backgrounds uh, to make this happen. Uh, so this is about, um, it's about being multidisciplinary, is being about interdisciplinary to be able to make use of data uh, for some specific application for certain specific sector. Now, of course, we, 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 we use these words every day, uh, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and so on. Half the people I talk to don't know the difference between the two words, but that's a different story. And we certainly, it's very hard to be multidisciplinary. It's very hard to be inter, harder to be interdisciplinary. Uh, but certainly when we talk about uh, collaboration for data, driven research and decision-making, uh, this is such a compelling part of that, that we, that we convince people uh, that really a problem is not solved uh, only by looking at one bit of the story. Um, and um, well, so data science, of course, to extract useful information from complex data and analysis and prediction. Uh, and not only that, but hopefully also understand the reasoning behind that prediction, uh, reasoning behind that decision making. And I keep wondering uh, about the computer human interfaces. Uh, so if you are dealing with a big data, uh, complex data, uh, and you know you come to some decision with some of the algorithm, how, how does machine actually convey uh, that decision uh, to the human master or slave or, or whoever that is, uh, right? So I think one would have to evolve uh, some heuristics, some way of reasoning with uh, limited human mind and basically saying, look, what is it? How does human mind actually reason? Uh, so, uh, you know, it's like, it may be like explaining my logic to a five-year-old it doesn't really matter, but I know how five-year-old thinks. So I can explain to him or her as to what this decision actually means uh, for her, uh, right? So I, like I told you, I'm not an expert in this, uh, but I keep thinking about these problems and saying, look, how do we trust a machine uh, for decision-making, especially if there's an autonomous action uh, involved in it? And of course, it's all driven by data. Uh, there are a lot of these coding hackathons that go on uh, right, I keep seeing that, okay, look, code for, code for this or code for that problem. And I al always keep telling these people, they're saying, look, before you code, you have to understand your problem, uh, right? So it is a lot like in India, they have know your customer. So it's KYC. So you need to have KYP uh, and know your problem. And knowing your problem actually means not just knowing the coding part of it, but it's knowing uh, what is the problem it is solving? What are the parameters of that solution? Who is the customer? Where is the market? Uh, is it an effective coding? Is it e you know, ease of navigation with this coding and so on? So, so all of that I think has some bearing on all our data science uh, algorithms and so on. Um, now, of course, India has immense amount of data. Uh, it's simply because there are lots of people, but equally important that there's a diversity of people uh, because you don't need all, you know, if you, if you have a very uniform population who are all doing the same thing, then it would be enough to have data for 100 people in a country of a billion people. But here, when you have a country of 1.3 billion people, all of whom are a little bit different from each other, if I may say so. 
so 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 that diversity uh, is that color of life if you would which changes a little bit from going another 10 miles 100 miles here so that provides a very rich variety of data uh, and 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 so the point is uh, what do you do with that data uh, and we say okay what do you do with that data of course you have to transform it into new opportunities uh, and new opportunities and do it with collaborations do it with uh, multidisciplinary inter interdisciplinary thinking and do it with uh, solving problems uh, for example in health in wellness in, in biomed in natural sciences even natural sciences because i've looked at so many papers where just based on huge amount of data which is experience and using some nifty machine learning algorithm that you can even predict the the crystal structure which has been a hard problem uh, in science so it takes a lot of art it takes a lot of um, insights and it takes of course some amount of, of formal algorithms uh, to come to these things and i keep thinking about the time when whole lot of data that we have well whether it's about the motion of planets and stuff uh, couldn't we conclude actually from there let's say newton's laws of motion uh, so it should be a simple uh, thing for for machine algorithm to basically make sense out of data as a pattern as a pattern recognition so i can imagine that you will see more and more application of data driven sciences together with algorithms uh, to get to the bottom of uh, you know knowledge if you would uh, right so what basically scientists like myself do now uh, so this unfortunate that some of us would be out of job. Uh, okay, but I hope that there would be new opportunities to compensate for that. Uh, anyway, we have to believe in a positive future. Uh, and of course, that the data that drives uh, things, uh, solutions in energy, water, transport, smart cities, smart villages, education, climate, environment, finance, commerce, governance, Look, e even after COVID-19 has disappeared from the margins of history books, we are going to have overarching challenges stretching out to infinity or as long as humanity is on the planet, uh, which are challenges of climate change, of the rise of intelligent machines, sustainable development, rise of antimicrobial resistance, uh, reaching, uh, you, know, you know, shoring up your healthcare and reaching to the last person on the planet. Uh, and I can, uh, you know, point out some other, uh, you know, overarching problems of humanity. These are not the problems that a generation before us faced. I mean, uh, you know, if you go back to the happy days of 50s, 60s, last century, last millennium, people thought that this party would continue forever. I mean, that there was no end to it, that technology would solve all our problems. Uh, okay, but we are a little bit more cautious now. And we know we have come to accept two degrees or three degree Celsius temperature rise by the end of this century, right? But remember that we are not here for a century. We should at least have to plan for five centuries, if not for a millennium, right? And this is a horrible problem that nobody has solution for, isn't it? I mean, we don't like to honestly admit that we don't have a solution and we have not thought that far. So now the point is, with all this digital stuff which is coming in, can we cool the earth? So, I mean, can we ask this question with all this data and collaboration and data driven, driven decision making and so on, can we think to be greater than human mind? Uh, of course, you cannot factor in the greed of human mind in all these algorithms, so maybe you could, I don't really know, right? Because that's something, okay, that, that one has to worry about, but there's a whole different thing. Uh, okay, so about data, about uh, curating data, interoperab interoperability and access are very important. We have whole, like I pointed out, India has a lot of data, but it's not, sometimes it is in the form of a PDF. I see a whole lot of it. Whole lot of data, in fact, which is published in all the scientific journals uh, is in some form which is not accessible as data that you can make use of. I mean, you, you would need huge amount of human resources uh, actually to, 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 to take out relevant data, uh, to search for it, 
and to transform it in a useful form. So what is the solution to that? Uh, well, of course, I keep discussing this point also with uh, the publishers or scientific publishers saying, look, what is the future of scientific publishing? Because this is where a whole lot of scientific data is, right? And, and remember that data is very precious because that data has been created with huge amount of resources that we call support for research. It has been created with huge amount of human resources. Uh, the, you know, uh, I mean, millions of scientists working over decades uh, to create that data is invaluable, right? This is a huge, the ultimate repository of data of all kinds. So, but uh, how do we make use of it? Uh, I mean, other than as uh, one scientist who created that data, uh, how do we have access to it? How do we recognize that data and pull it out uh, as required? So uh, I think that's a huge challenge. I don't know if there are solutions. You know, when I discuss with publishers, oh, I say, who cares? I'm making my money now, uh, right? Okay, I think about it when I come to it, uh, right? So should there be actually a data uh, format in which all, all the data in all the scientific journals is reported? or at least a repository of that data uh, is something which is accessible, which is transparent, which has ease of use and portability uh, into it. Uh, so if we could uh, do all of that, then we would actually free up a huge amount of a sea of data uh, that we otherwise is sitting in some digital library, in some physical library, uh, but one doesn't know how to get to it. I will give you a couple of examples of using, oh, I think I'm out of time, uh, Dr. Murthy. Uh, I'm out of time, right? Can yeah, you maybe you can table? take. Yeah, you can take one or two minutes. One or two minutes, okay. So let's say one minute thirty seconds uh, should be okay. Sorry, I got carried away with this data. Okay. is such a rich thing, uh, and then I never plan, uh, you know, for for any talk of this kind. So anyway, so so okay. I would conclude by saying that, uh, needless to say, that things stuff that you are discussing here today uh, is of utmost importance going forward now. And now we have just seen tip of the iceberg, uh, but going forward, uh, that's all the future is built, uh, built uh, on, on it. Uh, so uh, we are now coming up with a new policy is called Science Technology Innovation Policy 2020, uh, which would pay a lot of attention uh, to aspects of data. Uh, so I keep saying, look, it's not data is not a single thing about the policy. It is about data creation, it's about data dissemination, curation, formatting, flow of data, manipulating data, uh, who can do it, who cannot do it, how do you do it, uh, what are the regulations, what are the principles based on which all of this is done. The ownership of data becomes such an important, hot burning issue today, localization of data building upon data, if you build upon data, who is the owner of what you built? Now, so often we, you know, a lot of people that I talk to, especially scientists, they think data is some kind of raw material and therefore has very little value. Uh, I think we have to get away from that mindset uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's not just algorithm. It's, it's not just algorithm. I, if you were to ask me personally, algorithms are dime a dozen, okay? And they would keep evolving. Uh, right, and you can really make use of a whole lot of them. Algorithm, I would say about 20% part of the story. Real data that's useful and in the right form is, I would say, the majority of the story. So therefore, I would appeal to everybody to, to consider data uh, to be gold or water or oil or whatever you want to call it, um, but don't treat it with contempt. Uh, don't treat it with saying, ah, just, just take my data and do something with it and sell it back to me. Okay, that's one business model, but this is not a good business model, right? Uh, so this uh, science technology innovation policy, which of course looks at uh, the whole uh, ecosystem of science and technology in the country, would certainly pay a lot of attention to these uh, many different aspects of data. If you got any ideas, uh, that we could factor in the policy. Uh, please, Dr. Murthy, please make this yeah. uh, appeal on my behalf to yes. all your participants uh, about you know, what would they like to see in terms of uh, uh, a very good compelling policy for data management, if you would, from, from, from cradle to grave.
of data, yeah. right? Everything that happens in between, uh, right? Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for you. having me here. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure. I learned a few things just thinking about them here uh, myself. You know, while talking to people, some things are a little clearer uh, in your mind. Uh, and ha have a great conference, have a great summit. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you very much for, for, for your wonderful speech on the data. You have given a new dimension for the data, which is as important as water to us. Thank you very much, sir. So we have our next speaker, Ms. Lama Nahan, Nahman, is an Intel fellow in Intel Labs Systems and Software Research Lab. She has over 20 years of experience in the areas of context-aware computing, multimodal adaptive interfaces, sensor networks, computer architecture, embedded systems, and wireless technologies. Previous assignments at Intel involved researching and developing the next generation of self-organizing sensor networks or modes. And Intel modes platform, the very popular modes platform for IoT devices. She has deployed these technologies in healthcare applications as well as various other industrial settings. Ms. Lama. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction. And um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, it was really actually quite interesting to listen to uh, Dr. Sharma um, talk about you know, uh, natural intelligence and really addressing multidisciplinary um, uh, groups actually that are working on this type of research, which is really kind of a big part of what we're trying to do. So thank you for, for uh, the segue into my talk. Um, so what I want to talk about here today is how do we um, think about human AI systems, not in the human AI competition that, you know, Hollywood wants us to think about, but really more about, you know, how do we think of human AI collectives? Because at the end of the day, you know, speaking of diversity, you can't think of more diverse um, systems than ones that actually include humans and AI, and they really bring very different skills to the table. So actually trying to build systems that can um, utilize the power of both of these um, actors is uh, something that can actually propel us. But let me start um, by just talking a little bit about um, the research that we do. So um, lab that I run is actually a multidisciplinary um, research lab. And I love the distinctions between multi and interdisciplinary that you alluded to, Dr. Sharma, because that is definitely, um, today, it's like one of the things that we really try to do with multidisciplinary. But ultimately, if we get into the interdisciplinary um, approaches, that's definitely, uh, much harder to do, but much more, um, uh, a much better way of action. But our anticipatory computing lab is essentially made up of uh, user researchers and ethnographers, designers, and AI uh, people, and then you know, software and hardware engineers. And one of the things that we try to do um, is really, first of all, try to understand what problem we want to focus on. So we start with user needs. We do a lot of ethnographic research within the communities and try to identify what are those unmet needs and how do we go about creating technologies that can actually support um, these needs. The interesting thing about doing it in that way, it's not only does it identify what is the unmet need, but it also gives you a good sense of what type of metrics do you wanna define for these technologies? We keep talking about developing all of these algorithms that make sense out of data, but at what to what level of fidelity is that needed? Well, that depends a lot on what type of an experience are you actually trying to enable out of this data and what type of um, accuracy do you need out of these algorithms as an example. Um, we look a lot at the fusion of very different signals because if you actually want to take AI and scale it into the world, it's really important to bring the resilience that comes about from that multimodality. Um, so you improve coverage, but you also improve, improve the, the accuracy of these algorithms. So as I mentioned, um, one of the, um, the, the, the higher level concept that we're trying to enable here is really changing that narrative to go beyond automation and leaving people out of the loop to actually integrating people into the loop with these human AI collaborative systems. And we look at that through the lens of multiple um, verticals and different applications, right? So we do a lot of work in manufacturing, for example, and think about how do we bring 
humans and AI into that manufacturing um, uh, facilities? And how do you start to think about AI trying to really assist people in doing their day-to-day tasks? When we do a lot of work in education, and again, you have to take AI into the realistic environments and build technologies that are resilient in these environments and help empower the teachers to really support their role as teachers, not take them out of the teaching. Um, and then finally, you know, we do a lot of work in assistive computing and um, working with people with disabilities because at the end of the day, it is really about reaching every human on earth without leaving anyone out. So, you know, AI has a lot of potential in trying to really empower people with disabilities. So I'll talk a little bit about some of these different um, applications, but also I'll talk about some of the underlying capabilities that enable these type of experiences. So let's start with education. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we clearly know from the pedagogy research is that um, learning outcomes correlate with engagement. So if you can get students to be more engaged, you're going to get much better learning outcomes. So then the question really becomes, if you want to personalize that learning experience, how can technology understand learner engagement, um, just like a teacher would in, a, in, in real time, and then enable that knowledge um, to help the teacher, help the student, and personalize the, the, the learning experience. So, you know, one of the things to think about here is that as people are engaged with that learning content, you're able to actually get a lot of information from these multimodal signals, right? You have a camera on your PC, you have information that you're conveying through the content platform. So taking all of that information in and trying to really get a better assessment of um, the learner's engagement. And, you know, once you do that, then you need to actually close that loop, right? So that could be in enabling the teacher to understand the engagement of the student. And definitely, you know, it's, it's helpful in, in the classroom setting, but it's also now we, we kind of, it becomes very obvious during COVID and remote learning that that's even more important. Um, but you also, you know, help the students um, understand, you know, where they are in that learning um, journey and how do you personalize the education platform to support that. So one of the studies that we've done in actual school rooms, uh, school environments, is that, you know, trying to actually go in first and try to understand what is the problem that we're trying to solve and thinking about, about it from the different stakeholders within that environment, right? So the teacher is a stakeholder, the student is a stakeholder. The parents who are not in that environment per se, they are also stakeholders. So, you know, how, what are the things that you're trying to solve? How do you collect the data that you need? And then how do you start to build these algorithms that allow for that engagement assessment to happen? And one of the interesting things is that once you do that, and that's kind of one of my pet peeves with a lot of, you know, the researchers within the academic community is that, you know, we go and do all of these things and we show these algorithms that work, but we have to take them back into the real world, right? We can't just say, okay, well, now we've improved this from 1% or 2%, but how does that actually ultimately change that learning experience and those outcomes? Um, so, you know, one of the interesting things that we've noticed once we took that back into the school environment is that if you actually look at you know, two different classrooms, one enabled with engagement understanding and one isn't, so the treatment versus the control group, you see actually that the actual interventions change within that environment. So rather than the teacher trying to do much more monitoring and understanding who needs help and who doesn't, if you actually now are empowered with that, that, you know, the technology is actually helping you decipher that, then you can spend more of your time helping the students that need help rather than trying to do that close monitoring and assessment of that um, environment. Now, what's really interesting is that once you start to think about students at a younger age, so, you know, uh, students in higher level elementary and, and middle school, you know, do well with, you know, using laptops as the, you know, learning conduit, if you will. But when you start to think about younger students, and that is very, you know, it was made abundantly clear, you know, in COVID times, right? The students that struggled the most are actually the younger cohorts and the preschoolers and the early um, elementary school. And because learning in that age is very much um, a physical encounter, right? So, you know, kids use manipulatives, kids use objects, they actually use their whole body to learn. And, you know, we've done a lot of ethnographic research there to try to understand um, you know, what, um, what are, um, you know, parents' attitudes and teachers' attitudes towards 
you know, technology at that age. And you see that dilemma, right? On one hand, um, they see the value in bringing technology into the educational experience. On the other hand, everybody's terrified of screen time. So one of the things that we've been trying to think about is like, how do you actually think about um, discovery-based learning and thinking about agents and robots and a lot of that research within that space to try to actually bring back the physical environment into the education and utilizing this notion of smart environments that can allow the kids to actually interact much more physically with that environment. So one of the things that we've been experimenting with is can we actually bring those you know, virtual agents into these smart room settings where the physical agents now are actually aware of that physical environment, right? So they're, while they're projected within that space, they actually know about the physical environment. They can actually jump across objects and interact with students by learning and watching over the students. Because I don't know how many of you have kids, but I don't think kids actually interact in the same way that Alexa does, right? I mean, they use their bodies, their point, they gesture, um, they're doing physical tasks that the um, learning agent needs to be aware of, watching over, and then utilizing that for the dialogue. And again, we take that and we test it out in real physical settings, in educational settings, and try to understand how does that actually improve um, that learning experience. And one of the things that we were able to see is that it does actually improve engagement and that personalization does actually make a big difference within these environments. The second example that I mentioned is uh, people with disabilities. And, you know, one of the projects that I'm probably most proud of is the work um, that we've done with Professor Stephen Hawking. And, um, you know, it's, it's really interesting when you start to, you know, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And that was actually kind of the most interesting piece, because when we originally, you know, were approached by Dr. Hawking, um, you know, the, the question that was posed is, can we actually improve his words uh, per minute rate? But then once we actually went out and tried to understand and watch him, you know, perform the different tasks in these in his typical environment and do his everyday job, we realized that that's really not just the problem. I mean, Professor Hawking using, uses his PC to do everything in his life, speak to people, give his lectures, search, you know, the web, do his research, write documents, all of these things he actually does with his PC. So really, um, it is very hard to think about, well, how do we just superimpose these type of technologies that exist there? We have to really understand what his affordances are and wh what is he comfortable actually doing and how risk averse, you know, or willing to take on risk, especially when he's actually so dependent on that technology. Um, so at the end of the day, what he was really looking for is much more independence. He, every time he had to rely on somebody to come in and do something for him that took away, that chipped at that independence. So the idea was to try to think holistically about all of the different things that he does and how can technology come in to try to really automate a lot of that work so that he doesn't have to exert a lot of effort to do, to complete a, you know, all of his tasks. And, you know, one of the things that maybe we don't think about very clearly is because we're all used to this. I mean, we think about graphical user interfaces and they're awesome because you don't have to learn a lot of commands and all of these different things. But if you can't move a mouse, it's not really helpful at all. Right. So and that was essentially almost like the dilemma of many of those systems for people with disability that try to live on top of something like a Windows platform. So one of the things that we really try to do is think about how would you build um, you know, a software platform system that actually allowed you with very minimal input, in the case of actually Professor Stephen Hawking is what you see here um, on the screen, um, which is actually a proximity sensor that sat on his glasses. And uh, every time he wanted to do the equivalent of a push button, he would just move his cheek and that would get de detected by that proximity sensor. So now you're trying to translate a movement of one cheek, or for some people, maybe a movement of, of a finger or a, uh, an eyebrow, you know, uh, movement or something like that into complete um, control over your um, Windows platform, as an example, right? So what we ended up doing is creating, you know, systems that actually can understand the context of the user and translate all of that into a set of a few options that someone can easily just select from understanding the context of use and trying to predict what they might want to do next and what words they might want to speak and so on. So 
once we've actually done that for Professor Stephen Hawking, you know, it was very clear that there was a big gap in that community to, to build an open platform for innovation. Because there are tons of people who have amazing ideas on how do you actually customize uh, solutions for people with disabilities. And the thing with people with disabilities is everybody has a different set of abilities, right? So it's not like people with disabilities all can use the same thing. So what you really need is an open platform for that innovation to help people just kind of, you know, build whatever it is that they, they think is actually compelling. So you have a new sensor, great. You can go and bring that and then package it into something and then put it out into the open world so that, you know, people can actually um, utilize that. So we put that in open source and we brought in a lot of different sensors that can actually interact with these systems to enable that innovation. But one of the areas that, you know, a couple of areas I want to touch on is one, you know, Professor Stephen Hawking had the ability to move his cheek. There are a lot of people with disability who are totally locked in, who are unable to move a single muscle. And for those people, it's really important to start to look at, you know, brain computer interface, because that's really the only thing that they, can, they will always have control over. So one of the areas that we've been looking at is how can we actually bring a lot of the advancements in uh, data processing and machine learning to take very um, low fidelity sensors and definitely ones that, you know, you can get from open systems, you know, not your $20,000 EEG set, but something in the order of a few hundred dollars and compensate with a lot of machine learning to make these systems much more robust. And, you know, moving forward, ultimately, if you think about it, one of the hardest things um, for people who are unable to speak and unable to type is this delay when you're actually trying to communicate with loved ones or, you know, people that you're working with. Because what you end up having is somebody actually talking and by the time they're done talking, then you're going to start formulating your thoughts through a very limited interface. And now you have this long silence gap. So how do we try to close the silence gap? So one of the areas we've been actually looking at is, you know, all of the advancement in response generation, right? When you think about Alexa and many of those systems, well, that's fantastic. So how can we actually use the response generation systems to be human AI collaborative systems. Because what you're trying to do is not invent an Alexa that will replace the person, but have the person be able to actually control that Alexa, if you will, right? So how can you take things that are trained on millions and millions of utterances and be able to bring the personalization piece of what this specific person wanted to say and do and continue to make that system learn over time from that user? Um, so, to be able to do a lot of these, you know, different um, uh, applications, you really need, if, if you're actually trying to make these systems work with humans and learn with humans and from humans, they need to be able to understand humans and do that robustly in the real world. So, you know, some of the things, you know, that we've been looking at is, you know, first of all, you need to really understand who the user is. And, you know, while people think it's a solved problem, Yes, when you actually have your phone and you're looking actually at your phone, um, we actually can, you know, make the system understand this more easily. But, you know, in realistic environments and realistic settings, how do you start to think about multimodality and bringing vision and audio and make those two things learn together so that when you're sure about one signal, you can use that to train the other and do that robustly in the real world. Um, Another area that we've been looking at is, you know, when I talked about manufacturing and helping people accomplish these different tasks within these realistic settings. Well, if you need to do that, then um, you need to understand what people are doing and what specific tasks they're actually performing. So how do you bring in, again, what you can see from what somebody's doing and what you can hear and what objects they're interacting with and bring that into a multimodal fusion system that can actually understand how to fuse these different signals? and use a notion of certainty to try to understand how do you weigh these different signals. I talked about education and how different it is when you're actually trying to interact you know, with kids in the real world. Kids actually use gestures. You're trying to understand what physical activities they're doing. Did they do their math you know, correctly? And are they putting these objects together in the right way? So when we're actually thinking about dialogue systems, we have to think about dialogue systems that can understand not only what they're saying, but what they're gesturing and how what activities they're doing so that your response generation system can actually do that 
um, robustly in the real world. And then finally, I will comment on, you know, um, emotion recognition. And, you know, emotion recognition in some sense is, you know, extremely important for trying to understand the context of the user and what you do with that um, to be able to facilitate um, better experiences. But I would argue that emotion recognition is actually even more powerful for another reason, which is if you're going to actually put AI systems into the real world, they need to figure out how to continue to learn in the real world. And you know, one of the most important things to continue to learn is have a feedback signal. So it's very hard to have that feedback signal when you're requiring people to constantly give you explicit feedback. But if you're able to enable emotion recognition as a capability, then over time you can start to understand what are you actually doing right as an AI system and what you're doing wrong and use that to automatically feedback um, into the learning system. Now, everything that I've talked about in some sense, you know, requires a lot of intimate knowledge of the user and going into their you know, real environment um, and you know, knowing things that are very personal. It's absolutely important when we're talking about all of these technologies just to think about how do we develop these things responsibly. And you know, I can't overemphasize the importance of that. One piece of that puzzle is really trying to um, understand when these systems actually make these predictions how certain or uncertain are they of these predictions? And thinking about uncertainty as a first-class citizen in the design of these experiences, whether that is because you're trying to make these systems safer and understand where you need to bring in the human actor, or whether it's because you're trying to understand, you know, is this data set biased? And now you're actually looking at a distribution of data that has nothing to do with what you've actually trained your system on. So, it's very important to think about algorithms that can actually have very robust notion of certainty out of those um, um, predictions that they're making. And today with deep learning, we see a lot of examples of deep learning systems that are you know, making incorrect predictions, but being 100% certain of them, right? So you know, one of the areas that we've been looking a lot into is Bayesian deep learning, for example, and how do you actually start to bring principled uncertainty so that when you're actually giving a prediction, even if you're unsure, like if you're giving an incorrect prediction, if your certainty goes low with an incorrect prediction, then you're able to actually um, design a system that's aware of that. Um, it's extremely important to think about these systems as systems that need to be transparent, because as you bring humans and AI together, humans need to be able to understand why these decisions are being made. And Dr. Sharma actually commented that earlier. We need to have a mental model of how these systems work, not only just to understand them, but also figure out how do we modify them and what type of information we need to bring in to help them learn much more accurately. In everything that we've talked about, privacy is always a big concern. So as um, AI practitioners and developers within that space, we need to be thinking about what data we're collecting, why we're collecting it, what are we trying to infer out of it, who are we sharing it with, and how do we reduce the gap between what we're capturing and what we need to infer? You know, what, one of the areas that we've been looking a lot into is elderly care and being able to actually support people to stay longer in their home environments. But what we know is that people are very uncomfortable with having vision information coming out of these systems. You know, there are a lot of other sensors that you could use. You could use different types of cameras. You could use wireless sensing to be able to actually understand activities within homes. Right? And there's a lot of compelling research in that space. So how do you start to close the gap between what people are willing to be captured about them and how do you give them the, the belief that you're not actually capturing something that they don't want to be captured? And then finally, I'll just close with bias, um, which is really an area that should be on everybody's mind who's working in these systems because you know we see over and over again is that people who are usually marginalized in the world end up being marginalized by technology as well because the technology is learning from data in the real world. So as we building these systems, A, it's important to actually have um, extremely diverse groups of people who are actually building these systems because they will understand what type of blind spots they need to be looking into and where are these risks that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about you know, new 
um, types of algorithms that can actually enable us to um, understand when data is biased and 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 fix and, and accommodate for that bias as well. So with that, I will stop. And um, I don't know if we have uh, time for questions, but happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Lama. Uh, I could see that there are no questions. And uh, thank you very much for giving a good talk. Uh, it talks about uh, immersive learning and how brain, com brain computer uh, interface can be achieved through environment data and uh, other things and good uh, learning environment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. We have our uh, next speaker. Uh, Ms. Nivriti Roy, a global leader with 20 years of experience, technical and business leadership experience in the US and India. She has done varied roles across engineering and research innovation and organizational management. Her specialities are innovation, uh, concept to product, silicon design, analog and mixed signals, IPs, machine learning, and computer vision technologies. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, Ms. Nivriti Roy as live, but we have a video and it will be around 15 minutes, it will be paid. Organizers, please play the video. Good day, everyone. I'm very honored to be participating in the RACE conference where technology is playing the backbone role. Over the last several months, April onwards, how many of us have realized the value of technology, whether it's in the e-retail, whether it is in teleconsultation or even education. It clearly has become the foundation, the backbone of the transformation that each and every one of us is going through. While I talk about transformation of how we are living our lives, you know, many people call it the normal, uh, I also want to share with you over the last several years, the massive transformation that our country, India, has gone through. I'm going to talk about, if you look at the very top row, I'm going to be talking about, you know, what are the kind of demographics that we have? I'm going to be talking about technology adoption as well as innovation that has been driven in addition to the investment. So if you look at the demographics of India, we have the largest number of youthful population in the world. 65% of India is less than the age of 35 and the number of dependents on those is getting smaller and smaller. I also want to tell you that the middle class is growing. No longer is the population demographics looking like a pyramid. The Economist says it looks more like a mushroom, where the middle class is the largest. Middle class largest meaning spending capability is high. Each one of us have gone through the transformation that has been driven through the mobile phones. The amount of data we are consuming far exceeds the data consumption in China. How did this happen? This happened through innovation. One gig of data costs 25 cents for India as compared to $10 for many countries like US and Europe. Very many national level transformations have been made through platforms like UPI and GSTN. Several million industries are creating data on these platforms. I also want to tell you that in terms of foreign direct investment. If you look at the last 20 years, half of the investment has been made in the last four to five years. So while we are aware that India is transforming for the good, the world is also watching us. Our economy is touted to be doubling by 2025 in the next five years, of which trillion dollar contribution is going to come from digital economy. Now, digital economy is driven by many drivers. The fact that we have very many startups, we are the third largest startup ecosystem. We have, you know, seven to 8,000 technology startups. 
I also want to tell you that the number of months or years that uh, you know our companies startups are taking to become unicorn has reduced from 10 years to 4 years and we've seen some startups became becoming unicorn in a year and a half with the startups we have a very strong talent pool i know that 1 million engineers are graduating each year relevant to companies like mine intel so we have tremendous population that will be looking at creating technology solutions, technology R&D and technology innovation. I also believe that India is a clean slate as far as business model innovations are concerned. We've heard about XAAS, anything as a service. I believe we as a country will tremendously benefit from this model, this business model, which is pay as you use. Very much like, you know, we are using water and electricity. We will be using services. Our startup will not have to, you know, invest in building their servers or clouds. They can leverage platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. Now, all of this will be based on four thrust areas. If we are generating the kind of data that you know I talked about with 1.3 billion people, the spending capability, the usage of data, cloudification is going to be very, very important. One, cloudification is important to enable scale. The startups can leverage cloud services. The cloud can crunch a whole lot of data. The cloud can store a whole lot of data. And then there are a version of cloud we called edge. Edge is a cloud which is sitting very close to the consumer. So quality of service can be improved. AI and data analytics. I truly believe this is the technology which has the resources in plenty in our country. And I believe that AI is a technology that will give us a push and impetus that we have never seen before. If there is an industrial revolution happening, industrial revolution 4.0, India stands a huge chance of leading it because of its rich data uh, access, as well as world-class uh, R&D talent pool. We have a lot of mathematicians, a lot of statisticians, a lot of programmers. We need a little bit of reskilling to enable even more people to drive AI for the right use case. Network and connectivity. If the data cannot move from one place to another, it is no good, no use. So network and connectivity is important. In old days, people used to say, geography defines the destiny of a country. Geography meaning if there is a connection of a river from a city to a city, a country to a country. The same river is now the connectivity, the network, the 4Gs, the 5Gs that we are working on. In addition to these basic technologies, I also believe manufacturing will give us an edge. So a lot of manufacturing is happening uh, for cell phones. A lot of manufacturing is happening for automotives. What can we do more in terms of compute? What can we do more in terms of silicon is what we have to think about. A lot of these technologies will impact several segments. You know, we are all living through this pandemic a very deadly one, I must say, this pandemic has made us realize that we need to be pushing and accelerating this digital transformation. For healthcare, we do not want the non-COVID people to be suffering because they do not have or worry about access to hospitals. Can we get e-healthcare strong enough that a person sitting in Jaunpur can access a Tata Memorial Hospital doctor for the healthcare needs he has. Can we look at industrial transformation where we can drive quality, scale and export? We have 350 million K through 12 students in our country. And I will tell you, 
only 40% are in private education and in urban areas, 60% are rural and go through municipal schools. Can we leverage technology? Can we look at business models where all of our children, the 350 million children, can have access to education when this pandemic is happening and they do not have access to go to schools? Can we look at transportation and logistics? You know, we, we are seeing a lot of gig economy with Uber, Oyas, and, and uh, whatnot. Can we look at technology where more and more people have access to transportation? Logistics becomes much easier, which is technology-driven, AI-driven. Retail. Retail is going to modernize our stores, whether the stores are, you know, MSME, the micro ones, those are in millions in our country. Can we get them a platform and access through technology such that their reach becomes higher and higher? 15 billion US dollars and 2 billion connected devices will happen by 2022. I truly believe India has an edge as far as technology transformation, especially leveraging AI is concerned. We can leapfrog into AI-based transformation, very much like from cash-driven economy to digital wallet-driven economy, and we skipped the credit card. Several such technology transformation can be skipped. Can we skip, you know, really 4G, 90% uh, adoption? Can we skip building millions of hospitals because we have uh, you know fewer hospitals uh, beds available through you know other business models where we have access to beds like our government is doing in trains for example in hotels that are not being used so think innovative think more business use cases and look at how we together can drive digital transformation a lot of research is required. You know, this AI uh, has been in research for the last 50 some years. Why is AI being talked about now? AI is being talked about now because a convergence of technology is happening. Our compute has become super fast. In 2000, one teraflop compute would cost millions of dollars. Today, eight teraflop can be sitting in our latest iPhone and cost us $600. From million to six, one teraflop to eight teraflop. All of that has happened. But how did that happen? It happened because our Moore's law happened. More and more transistors could be packed in the same space, doubling the density in every 18 months to two years. Battery became 90% cheaper in the last five years. So many such innovations happen. I, I, I shared that our data costs 20 cents. That's why we are consuming a lot of data. So a lot of convergence of technology happens when technology moves into solution and adoption. Now, to move the, res the research into technology adoption, a lot of application has to happen for the right use cases. I will share with you a Mirza Ghalib share. Uh, you know, it's a little hilarious, so I'm going to change some words, but you will get the point. Mirza Ghalib said, Fakat baal rangne se kuch nahi hota galib कुछ नादानिया कुछ काम भी किया करो जवान रहने को इन द सेम वे टॉमस एडिसन सेड द वैल्यू ऑफ अ टेक्नोलॉजी और एन आईडिया लाइज इन यूजिंग ऑफ इट सो ईच वन ऑफ अस टुगेदर वी कैन रिसर्च एआई वी कैन टॉक एआई बट अनलेस वी पुट इट टू यूज or like Ghalib says, put it to action, it will not create value. 
So my ask of all of you is drive the research into implementation through this bridge of applied engineering, building use cases, and we can only do it together. Otherwise, an innovative a technology which we have researched on stays in the book and after two years becomes useless because any IP's life is two years to create value out of it. So my ask is, how can we work together to cross this bridge and create research and technology into use cases which impact the lives of our people? Each efficiency that we gain through compute, through technology, through AI, through automation is tremendously powerful, which can be shown through this example. It is a very easy example. 1.01 raised to 365 equals about 38. What is it telling you? Each one of us have a capacity of 100% of what we do, so one. But if each day, each and every 365 days, we add 1% efficiency to our contribution, whether it is us as individual, whether it is us and as an academic institute, industry, or even a country. If our country adds 1% efficiency on a daily basis, we can increase the output value by 38 times. Whatever we were delivering, we can increase it by 38 times. On the contrary, if we reduce our efficiency, become lazy, not leverage technology, not adopt technology, not know what is happening, we will be losing efficiency on a daily basis. Then our output could become as much as zero. To end my presentation, I want to share with you that innovation means invention plus the impact that it creates. So invention is only as good as its application. If invention is applied, it creates impact. And that is what, in my words, innovation is. So I want to end with India has tremendous opportunity to drive innovation for its own self, like the Atma Nirbhar Bharat, but the Atma Nirbhar Bharat can also create innovation for the world. So made in India, but made for the world. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that is uh, Nivriti Roy, uh, who is a country head for Intel India. Now let us move on to the panel discussion. The moderator and other speakers I will just introduce. Mr. Sumit Verma is currently the director as a mod as strategy and at Intel India. He leads key external alliances in innovation, research, business enablement, and strengthens strategic partners' engagements in priority technology areas like AI, IoT, big data, and 5G. For Intel India, he leads key initiatives like leadership and excellence and academic development program, the lead program, Design India, Maker or Innovation in Startup Ecosystems and Grand Research for Intel India. Sumit has been with Intel for over 18 years. Sumit will be the moderator for this session. Professor Kaushik Roy is currently Edward G. Tridman, Jr. Distinguished Professor at Purdue University. He received his PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1990. He was the Semiconductor Process and Design Center of Texas Instruments at Dallas, where he worked on the FPGA architecture development and low power circuit design. He was a research visionary board member of Motorola Labs in 2020, 2002 and held at the, uh, the MK Gandhi Distinguished Visiting Professor of IIT Bombay. Professor Ido Dagan is a professor of computer science uh, at Bar Ilan University, Israel, the founder of the natural language processing, the lab at Baran, Bar Ilan, and fellow of the Associate Computing of the Linguistics. He and his colleagues established the textual entitlement recognition paradigm, and he was the president of ACL in 2010 and led the establishment of the journal transaction of Asian Association for Computational Linguistics which is one of the popular premier journal in NLP. 
Dragon received his PhD degree in computer science from Technion. The next speaker is the next panelist is Dr. Alok Day. He is a corporate vice president of Samsung Electronics and the CTO of Samsung R&D Institute in India, where he is responsible for Samsung IoT data platform and advanced service. Dr. Day is considered as one of the most influential CIO or CTOs of India. He is the recipient of the Alexander Graham Bell Prize in Canada, IET Memorial Award, IDC Insights Award, and Genov Entrepreneur of the Year Award. He is a senior member of IEEE and fellow of IETE, Indian National Academy of Engineering, INAE. Dr. Day holds a PhD from McGill University, Montreal. The next speaker is uh, Dr. K. R. Murli Mohan. is currently Scientist G and Mission Director of National Mission on I in Interdisciplinary Cyber Physical Systems and heading the Frontier and Futuristic Technology Division. A PhD from Computer Engineering from Delhi College of Engineering. Participated and he participated in the Technology of Innovation and Policy Program at Kennedy School of, of Government at Harvard University. Yeah, over to Sumit for the detailed panel discussion. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to moderate this panel of extremely seasoned leaders and so very relevant to this topic of collaboration for data-driven research and decision-making. Uh, the audience should be able to gain a lot of insights from this panel, which will focus on international collaboration for building a strong foundation of data-driven research uh, and products for public good. I look forward to learning as well as sharing my inputs. When we talk about collaboration in data space, uh, one thing that comes in our mind is collaborative AI, which is problem in public or private enterprises that requires collaboration, uh, which could be uh, across multiple agents like human machines to take decisions that maximizes overall goal while balancing the individual's uh, personal goals. Uh, this is referred as to collaborative AI, uh, which develops uh, far superior collective intelligence through computational models of such interactions amongst the various collaborative agents. However, for this talk, uh, uh, the second aspect which we will focus in the panel is collaboration between researchers from multiple fields across departments universities, industries, and countries. This could be knowledgeable AI, computational neuroscience, uh, brain inspired uh, compute, robotics, uh, human computer interface, and so on. The right collaboration results in quantum improvement in these cognitive systems that will be difficult for otherwise uh, to be done through specific specialized communities to achieve independently. So data strategies and collaborations are required from government, academia, and business leaders. The format of the panel is divided into three parts. The first and the major part is uh, for the four panelists, Professor Kaushik, Professor Ido, uh, Dr. Alok, and Dr. Murli, uh, can share their perspective on this topic and have about five, six minutes. Uh, we expect to complete this part in the next 25 minutes. Second part will be Q&A uh, there, and we are open to take questions from the audience as well. So please post your questions on the session. And we'll close, uh, where we'll take uh, input and closing word from each panelist. And if we stick to the stipulated time, I'm sure we can finish it in 45 to 50 minutes. I also understand Professor Kaushik has to leave. Uh, so we'll start by inviting Professor Kaushik to share his insights. Uh, Professor Kaushik, over to you. Uh, uh, thanks, Sumit. Um, I'm just going to share my screen if that's okay. Huh? Um, and uh, I'm going to use a couple of slides. Um, at least, uh, uh, can you see what I'm trying to share? Uh, can, can you see? Yes, we can. Yes, we can see. Oh, okay, great, great. All right. So what I want to do uh, today is, uh, you know, in the next uh, four or five minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the area of brain-inspired computing. We have there's a center that we have, which is funded by you know Department of Defense, which is DARPA, and uh, 14 other um, uh, companies 
uh, SRC companies, and that includes you know Intel, IBM, you know TSMC, uh, Samsung, and others. So with that in mind, I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, uh, brain the, the kind of work that we are doing over there, and uh, that can potentially foster collaborations and other things, huh? going all the way from algorithms, architecture to devices. Um, just for the introduction, uh, you know, AI certainly is scaling and scaling across different applications that includes image analytics, you know, transportation, security, and so on. And more recently, you might have heard that AI lost to, uh, in a debate to Harish Natarajan, but it was very, very still very persuasive. Uh, it is also scaling across <laughs> industry. And, um, uh, you know, a number of papers, course enrollment, VC funding, they're all sort of skyrocketing. So there's a lot of excitement and interest. Uh, however, there are several uh, problems, uh, issues related to the compute demands of AI. And this is an example of, uh, you know, uh, if you take some machine learning computational cost over the years, and if you take, for example, NAS, which is the na network architecture synthesis as an example, uh, the number of operations required for that to be implemented on transformer is about, you know, uh, three or five zeta operations, which is 10 to the 21. So the machine learning is a huge computational cost, which is an equivalent, if you really look at it, the carbon emission from NAS is about 315X higher than the air travel from New York to San Francisco per passenger. So that's humongous. So on the other side of it, to meet this computing demand, there's a need to really think about the kind of architecture and devices that we wanna use. So if you really look at Denard scaling, uh, that has sort of stopped. And the general purpose systems have hit you know, performance and energy wall. And also at the same time, we're really looking at the von Neumann bottleneck, which is basically the uh, bottleneck between the memory and the CPU. So um, there's a need for really thinking about domain specific accelerators. And that's a key for really uh, you know, accelerating AI. So on the other side of it, this is an example of a case study that we looked at on object recognition in a smart, smart glass and a state-of-the-art accelerator. And uh, this is basically doing, uh, you know, implementing uh, <clears throat> object recognition, implementing retina net on DNN. And it turns out, uh, you know, if you really implement this, uh, uh, <clears throat> this uh, smart glass, uh, the battery time is gonna be of the order of about one hour under ideal conditions. So now if you, you look at the real operations, it's probably gonna be half an hour and that's not sustainable. So the question of course is where do these inefficiencies come from? They come from algorithms, hardware architecture, circuits and devices, because you know, we certainly have an existential proof that uh, you know, brain is efficient. So can we really uh, you know, use some cues? So, so far I just talked about the compute efficiency, but there are other issues. You know, the, uh, you know, today AI requires a humongous amount of data to learn. So the question is, can you, can you learn with less data? The other problem is AI is a black box. Uh, we don't know why it works so well, and sometimes we don't know why it doesn't work in some cases. So the, can I really have a better generalization and robustness uh, uh, analysis and model for AI? So if I, this is a chair, the question of course is, are those chairs or not when I'm trying to test my system? And uh, some of you might actually be familiar with the fact that uh, uh, there's something called robustness or adversarial robustness. I'm showing a uh, you know, clean image of a, of a uh, Macau. And if I add some noise to it, which is adversarial perturbation, uh, the same one, that same image looks to the human eye, still a Macau, there isn't really any difference. But my, now my system basically says, hey, um, it is uh, a bookcase with a very high confidence. So that's a problem. And finally, there's something that, you know, we humans do really well, we keep on learning and uh, we can do lifelong learning or incremental learning and we don't forget old stuff. But uh, there's something called catastrophic forgetting that happens in today's uh, you know, system. So there's a need for really thinking about how to really learn and learn in an incremental manner. So to that effect, what we believe, and as a part of our center that we're looking at is, can we take cues from the brain? Uh, to that effect, can I really use, for example, the right kind of neuron model? I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but more Hodgkin Huxley kind of model or uh, a leaky integrated and fire kind of model can I use, for example, learning and, and, and localized learning like uh, you know, spike time independent plasticity or back propagation? Can I use the right kind of network topology that is used in the brain? Uh, and, and finally, <clears throat> can I use the communication uh, and, and computing principles and compute with spikes so that I can potentially get uh, energy efficiency? 
but that also requires that you can do the right kind of input coding uh, for um, these networks, you know, rate coding, um, you know, DVS inputs and other things that one can potentially use. So to that effect, uh, you know, as a part of our center, we've been looking at uh, bioplausible learning algorithms, going all the way from looking at, you know, uh, experiments on primates and then determining what kind of bioplausible network architectures are suitable. Can we use brain-like information representations and design spiking neural networks or other, other forms of networks and do uh, interesting learning? Uh, can I do lifelong learning? Uh, looking at theory and robustness, as I mentioned, today's systems are really you know, a black box, can we, can we really open the black box? And finally, I didn't really talk much about, you know, today's um, uh, uh, transistors may or may not be, you know, absolutely suitable for implementing neurons and synapses is a huge amount of work which is going on and designing, you know, other kinds of new technologies, uh, non-volatile technologies like the PCM, RAMs, um, spin devices, can we effectively use some of these devices to mimic the neuron and synaptic operations and thereby get, uh, improvement in energy efficiency. On the other side of it, if you really look at these algorithms that are being developed, uh, you need a proper hardware to efficiently implement not only current um, uh, you know, algorithms, which are LSTMs and the convolutional neural networks, but going further down the road, you need to really think about graph neural networks or you know, causal or explainable AI workloads. But today we are really using multi-cores GPUs and accelerators and hence there's a need for really thinking about, you know, uh, addressing the memory bottleneck, doing in-memory computing uh, in approximate and stochastic hardwares. And we also believe that neuro-inspired algorithm hardware core design is required uh, to really achieve the kind of impor uh, improvement that we need. Uh, finally, uh, there's a need to also think about distributing intelligence. Uh, we certainly understand the fact that, um, you know, today's intelligence would uh, really be lying close to the edge devices but the edge devices may not have the power to do uh, the kind of computations. So how do I distribute the computing capacity across the computing stack going from edge hub to the cloud? You know, the computing capacity, looking at the computing capacity, bandwidth, energy, uh, security, and so on. And, and uh, so to that effect, there's a need for really thinking about, uh, uh, you know, doing distributed learning um, between peer-to-peer, -peer, which are, can be a swarm of drones as an example, or the edge hub cloud. And uh, finally, to have a collective intelligence that might come uh, for ex as an example from multi-view cameras and so on. And again, in that domain, there's also need to re really think about robust and distributed learning. And at the end of it, I think there's a need for really developing uh, a theory, theory of proper learning so that uh, we can really open the black box. So with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, I, Unfortunately, I need to leave, but I can certainly see if there are any questions that I can answer. Uh, Professor Kashik, I, I would like to ask a question and um, I know you have to leave. Sure. Uh, so real quickly, you know, you are the director of the Seabrick Center, which has over a dozen uh, industry uh, members, industry sponsors, over a dozen universities, as well as, you know, government funding involved. Uh, can you just highlight your challenges or experiences in terms of collaborations done at this scale uh, where data is concerned? Yeah, uh, you know, one of the things about the university certainly is that uh, we open source everything. And um, uh, when we are developing uh, some of the, uh, the tools, uh, we do work with industries and uh, in terms of technology transfer. Uh, and, uh, I, I know that, uh, you know, Intel is here. I mean, we have... Uh, we have had several discussions with Intel in terms of uh, sharing some of the codes that we might have developed, huh? um, some chips that we are developing uh, uh, for, from the hardware point of view. Uh, we are also developing data sets. Uh, uh, you know, University of Pennsylvania um, is involved uh, uh, from the robotic side of things and uh, drones. So they actually give us the data sets. Uh, in some of these cases, uh, we're also developing the virtual environment for some of these data sets uh, for drones and robots. Um, so in terms of the collaboration, uh, you know, um, there, as, I, as I said, there are 14 industries involved. Uh, they're putting in their money for research. Along with that, we have uh, Department of Defense or DARPA funding, which is about 40% and 60% comes from the industries. Um, uh, it's actually a $36 million center uh, uh, involving 10 um, uh, universities. 
and 19 faculty or so. Does that sort of tell you, I mean, um, uh, there's a good amount yeah, of joint no, collaboration. I, 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 yeah, yeah. Great. And then uh, well, diverse you know, aspects of, you know, uh, and, uh, hardware, learning algorithms, uh, in fact, interestingly, devices and distributed learning. As you can see, we're basically looking at the entire stack. And at the end of it, uh, we certainly believe, and, and, and at one time, you know, the neural networks and AI did mix, uh, you know, it, it did happen in 2010, 2011, because the GPUs were available, the computing, um, uh, the compute was available. And at the same time, you know, the data was available, but we are also in a situation as I was showing you, and the compute requirements are going out of bounds. So there's the need to really do that, look at this entire stack and to really develop, uh, you know, for example, uh, going forward into new workloads like explainable AI and all. There's a need to really look at the entire stack to be able to, um, you know, meet not only the compute demand, the energy efficiency and so on. Well, uh, I know we're running uh, uh, out of time for your next meeting, Professor Kaushik. So thank you very, very much for taking out time from a busy schedule. And thanks for the wonderful talk. And we will circle back with you on the panel outcomes. But thank you so much. Sure. And thank all the best for the center. Because our review, annual review is uh, today. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Kaushik. Thank you. Uh, I now invite Professor Ido from Bar Ilan University, which is the second largest academic institution in Israel, uh, to share his perspective and thoughts on this topic. Over to you, Professor Ido. Hello. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for, uh, for the, to, thanks the organizers for inviting me. Um, as was uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, my research area is natural language processing, known as NLP. And I will share some perspectives uh, on state of affairs in this area of artificial intelligence and uh, share some perspectives where I think, you know, what are, I think the state of affairs is right now, uh, where things might go and how collaboration might uh, help in that direction. Um, so in natural language processing, I guess, uh, uh, almost everyone has witnessed uh, the recent progress. Uh, I mean, we now st start seeing experience uh, natural language processing applications in daily life. Uh, when you talk to, to your uh, smartphone, when you ask questions on Google and you see that they can, now questions can be answered, not just simple searches, and also in other cases. Um, and in the recent years, to a large extent, uh, this major progress uh, happened and was enabled through deep learning neural networks, the kind of technologies that people uh, are reviewed and referred to in this session. So from that perspective, like most areas in AI, um, uh, the big boost for natural language processing technology also came from uh, deep learning uh, applying uh, neural networks with all kind of the typical characteristics, requiring a lot of data to learn from and requiring uh, intensive compute power. Um, but the bottom line is that eventually uh, it did uh, improve a lot of performance in many applications. That's part of the reason why we see improvements in many areas. That's why Google Translate is better today than it used to be. Um, but still, when we think about natural language processing, uh, our holy grail is kind of uh, um, developing uh, um, models, uh, software that in some sense simulates uh, human understanding of language, human understanding of text or speech. And uh, with all due respect to the recent advances, advances thanks to deep learning, um, deep learning hasn't uh, advanced that perspective that much. Um, Quite a few people uh, tend to say today that thanks to deep learning, uh, computers are now very good in solving data sets in the sense that if you have a certain type of questions and answers and you uh, let the model learn from a huge amount of questions and answers, now the model will be able to answer new questions fairly well. But still it might also very easily fail on something that seems really straightforward for human. So in many cases, it's hard to make the system, the NLP system look very 
silly and really lacking understanding. This indicates that uh, there is no really uh, profound understanding within these models. Uh, they are often more captured like and perceived like highly sophisticated pattern matchers that can perform well if they if somehow they can map the, the new input or the new task to something they've seen in the past. But if you somehow change in a tricky way a little bit the circumstances, um, they may be uh, very brittle. Um, and also uh, with these methods, the deep uh, learning methods, the neural networks, we all know it's massive networks. Uh, we've seen some examples in the slides where people were illustrating these uh, uh, networks. Um, the, some deficiencies that we face with them is that they are not well understood. I mean, to a large extent, a question answering system nowadays that is trained for many, many examples of question and answers um, works like a black box. And we don't understand really how the internals of the network um, model different aspects of, of the question. How does it refer to the predicate in the question, to the question word? How does it refer to knowledge about the domain uh, the domain about which the question is asked. Um, so from that perspective, when you're de dealing with systems that you don't really understand how they work internally, uh, it's hard to advance beyond a certain kind of glass ceiling. Uh, at a certain point, it's hard to, uh, um, it's hard to develop methods uh, that address more complex systems. Uh, so that's where uh, state of the art in NLP is today, where on one hand, there is uh, high enthusiasm and great successes in pushing technology forward, in performing much better, much more accurately in things that we, for which, over which, for which we were performing uh, kind of uh, worse just a few years ago. But on the other hand, people feel that there is still kind of, uh, we are facing a wall in our um, path to, to gain or to give computers more profound understanding of the language. Um, so a few aspects that I believe that I believe are important and I'd like to share with you that might lead us in, in better uh, towards better uh, kind of uh, modeling uh, are the following and I'll kind of mention um, four points that I, I, I'd like to share. One is, I, is uh, what I call decomposition. Uh, in many cases, and kind of quite popular approach in language processing and also in other areas, is to build neural models as end-to-end -end system, in the sense that you uh, give a system uh, a question and you expect it to spit back the answer. You don't really control what's going inside. Um, but it seems that in, ever, in order to be develop better models, we need to understand what are kind of the building blocks building block problems that we need to model in a more decomposed way, solve the smaller problems in order that by putting them together, we can later solve bigger problems. Uh, and this would also give more control and more explainability to the way our system uh, works. And it also, in a sense, is uh, the task of neural networks. I mean, the deep learning is not kind of magic. Uh, and when you give it a task that is too hard, it doesn't perform that well. Breaking into simpler, smaller problems might also help us get the most from the deep learning technology. Uh, the second aspect is how can we model some elements of the outer world uh, to which text or language refers? When we talk about something, we are not really thinking about the text, we are thinking about the real world behind it. If we are describing some conference like this one, we kind of imagine people speaking and talking about AI, etc. Uh, computers don't have right now the ability for that. Um, people build models for very small confined worlds. Like if you want a, a machine, uh, you would like natural language to operate a robot in a controlled environment, you can start building really a precise model of that environment. But people would like to use NLP in broader open domain context. And the question is how we can more shallowly uh, model the context in which the um, um, NLP pro uh, program works. Another uh, aspect that may be related to the more profound modeling of the context is integrating deep learning with uh, symbolic, uh, with symbolic uh, computation, kind of the old days type of AI. Uh, because it's clear that some aspects of language understanding or some aspects of interest uh, do have a symbolic nature. And in order to capture them, uh, we need more of that. And there are efforts, uh, quite many efforts today uh, 
to work in these directions. And lastly, I think um, we need to develop NLP more in interactive settings. We are used to use, uh, um, uh, let's say, Google Translate, where we give it a text and get back the translation. But when we try to talk to our uh, virtual assistant or to phone, we know that we cannot really get a lot of interaction. So I think pushing the ability uh, to make collaborative kind of conversations, uh, somewhat in the sense of uh, Mrs. Nachman, uh, that refer to collaborative human computer efforts, uh, kind of leveraging both human intelligence and machine intelligence is a very important aspect. And I think we need to work much more on, intera on interactive aspects. So setting up the, this kind of state of affairs, I'd like just to refer to how collaboration um, can get into place here. And I th I'd like to talk about collaboration in general. I don't distinguish here between international collaboration or national collaboration, uh, but the, obviously international collaboration is a good way, a good uh, mechanism to steer uh, collaborations of different types of people, of different types of disciplines. And here I think we need to think about collaborations within AI and technology development, interaction, let's say, between um, uh, language processing and knowledge representation between language processing and human com computer interface, HCI, language processing and other modalities, vision, uh, video processing, image processing, speech processing. We need uh, this kind of technology internal collaborations. On the other hand, we need collaboration with external disciplines that want to consume AI. And uh, that's in order to give kind of a guideline uh, for our technology so we can really develop it. Uh, in an effective manner. So we need these two different types of collaborations, kind of AI internal and between AI and external disciplines that would like to use AI. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, uh, Professor Edo for sharing your collaboration experiences and insights on NLP research. Uh, very uh, wonderful and thank you so much. May I now request Dr. Alok to share industry perspective on the challenges and opportunities in this data-based collaborations. So good evening, good morning and good day to all of you. I think you got a broader theoretical base and the data in the context of AI let me address a few nuances from industry perspective, as you said, fundamentally. Though big data is a more recent phenomena, but we have always been data driven. It's just that in the past, we had very limited data available to use. The digital methods and tools have been very scarce and unsophisticated. So what has changed over time that it has now become a very systematic approach. How do we collect data? How do we ingest data in a platform? How do we clean data, transform data from one form to another, store, manage, optimize speed performance, access, analyze? That has changed. That has become much more systematic. In fact, my worry is it's now going the other way from very limited data to a big data, to super large data. If you look into the data for data, in 2018, 13 zettabytes of data is projected to grow to 175 zettabytes in 2025. Now, by the way, just to be clear, one zettabyte means trillion gigabytes. And that is a CAGR growth of 60% in these seven years that we are talking. So it's going to be super large data. Now that brings to the point that we will soon be overloaded with data. And if we cannot handle it well, people would feel how to get back to relevant small data or medium data instead of big data to make sense. They will think about this whole big uh, data dimensions and say, can I go into lesser dimension space to be able to make sense for my business purpose. And this is very, very important that correspondence of data with the business logic. 
consolidation of data against a business purpose contextual interpretation of data otherwise it is meaningless i mean ms nebruti was talking about applications but this correspondence between the data and the business logic is becoming very very important another things that we uh, have started talking is about data lineage you know how do you go back to sources of data tracking data origins where did it come from if something goes wrong there is a liability can i trace back to the data origin is the pace of source of data that is coming and the business logic movement are they in sync because if you get us uh, data changes in one frequency and if your business logic are moving much faster then data may become stale so important is to have some kind of connectedness of data analysts with the business users and synchronicity of these two events let me explain that this morning we had a solution launch from samsung today is world site day uh, second uh, thursday of october is maintained as world site day by iapb and we talked about how smartphone and ophthalmoscopic attachment with smartphone could work together for early detection prevention of blindness and we can see complementary data being generated at eye clinics in fact in our webinar we had doctors from narayan netralay lv prasad i care and many other shankar netralay that we are working so what we generate at the physician side the eye clinic side and what we bring at the samsung level in the engineering side of it how do you combine and this is a collaboration in my opinion where it is not homogeneous data but heterogeneous data that we are able to bring it together let's take another collaboration example at the industry level this was more at the company level with few partners for example data interoperability across iot ecosystems today there have been many connections uh, there have been connectivity forums called ipso ip smart objects there is zigbee alliance z wave oma open connectivity foundations one m to m mqtt lots of different protocol so we realize that we cannot get rid of all of these they all serve a different purpose i chaired the ocf in india and we have made this as a standard and working with 1m to m that is becoming india's standard for smart city and ocf is for smart building and home but what we realized that we needed one dm one data model that is refining a semantic definition format we call it sdf so doesn't matter what kind of model that you are following if so or zigbee or oma but this sdf would translate that into a common format so that systems can be interoperable for that matter take any field and i think ms lama was talking about education so how much education growth has been happening in the pandemic time we all know and how the teachers and administrators can find out what happened in the past uh keep an eye out of an unexpected event devise new lessons based on data discover how to use data to improve student performance in fact on the inaugural speech of race 2020 our honorable prime minister mentioned how children data can act as a mirror he talked about if we can accumulate that data information it can help them at every stage in their life in the growth but at the end we must realize that data is data what matters is insight data is water we talked about professor sharma talked about it but water has to be used and water is used in different forms so what matters is that insight business analytics and it is extremely important to understand when data may be not suitable when it is suitable particularly when you are creating new initiatives you may not have a data as a first point and you will create data but you have to start still at the last point uh, in this round let me highlight a little bit about open data 
and uh, behavioral, transactional, financial, all kinds of data that are coming. Many initiatives have been taken, but I must say that some are successful, some are not. And open data can be very non-textual materials. You can have maps, you can have genomes, you can have medical data, chemical compounds, biodiversity data. So whenever entities have adopted a win-win philosophies, we have seen a good collaboration has happened and open data has stemmed out of that. But if we do not form that win-win collaboration, whether it is at country level or company level, we have seen that things fizzle out. There are times that top-down approach work. There are times that bottom-up approach work much better. And there are inherent challenges in this open data because there is a trade-off between data privacy. On one hand, people are talking about how do we make our data private and why are we sharing on all of these data? On the other hand, we are talking a public database. We are talking about open data set. So there is an inherent conflict but at the same time, if we architect well, uh, there is a possibility uh, that it can be managed. And we must have data set to have our deep tech built for AI driven AI algorithms to learn, to evolve. So there is no shortcut. And as I said, government agencies like regional transport office for driving data, it's very meaningful if you want to build some autonomous uh, car driving solutions. FCI and agriculture agencies can talk about grain data, but privates would come slowly and uh, they would like to have that win-win collaboration. So in summary, do we need data for research? Absolutely. Do we keep user data privacy in mind? Absolutely. Should we collaborate then? Absolutely. And is it possible to do that way? Very much if we architect the open data policy and system design well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Alok. Uh, your talk's very insightful. Uh, you brought in uh, how uh, collaborations on heterogeneous data uh, Samsung has brought together uh, through their programs. Uh, that also brought, touched upon the points of data, data interoperability uh, across platforms and you know uh, the focus that needs to be there on to architect open uh, data interoperability. So thank you very much. And uh, may I now request Dr. Murli to share government's focus on such collaborations and if possible, uh, cross country challenges, if any, uh, what they say for database research. Uh, over to you, Dr. Murli. Uh, thank you, Sumit. Thanks for this opportunity. I would like to dwell upon, you know, the systems approach for the collaborations. Now, when you talk about the collaborations, uh, I find it, you know, it is in the research collaboration and translation and the collaborations for technology development. These are the two streams what I feel that you know, the collaborations are very much essential. Now, that is the requirement what government of India is doing, particularly Department of Science and Technology, and what are the, you know, the systems that has been planned or implemented on ground to have these type of collaborations. Now, as part of the, you know, the national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical systems, uh, we have established 25 innovation hubs across the country. Now, these innovation hubs are spread, spread across the country when you say it is a hub, it has to collaborate with the spoke, and then in turn, it has to collaborate with various academic organizations. So there is a type of a platform where the collaboration inbuilt. So when you say about you know, the hubs, the model is the hub, spoke, and the spike models. Now, we have these 25 innovation hubs across the country. They, in turn, will have to collaborate with the minimum of you know the 500 you know the spokes in the national and international level at that the spike level also that is the individual researchers maybe it is fan from 1000 to 2000 the you know, researchers these innovation hubs the spanning across all the technologies starting from artificial intelligence robotics iot sensing 
you know, quantum technology. So you name the not one of technologies, all are covered in these innovation hubs. Now, when you talk about you know, the research collaborations, the academic collaboration is happens at the hub level. Now, the translation aspect has to happen and the technology development has to happen with, along with the industry collaborations. So therefore, each hub is a platform wherein it brings the research fraternity, the knowledge generating community, plus the industry partners as the co-developers for technology translation and co-development and technology development. Now, that will not end the story. We need to have their user space. So we are trying to bring all the line ministries, the state governments and the PSUs also as brought onto the, the platform so that the issues, the technology requirements for these ministries and the PSUs and then the state governments will be taken up as a research problem or a technology development problem for the in the hubs. Therefore, the entire ecosystem of collaboration from the academic collaboration and the industry collaboration plus the user base that is line ministry and the state governments are also brought down to this particular part. So this is a huge type of a, you know, effort uh, you know, to bring all these players onto a single platform and to, uh, try to uh, you know, uh, go across the, you know, the uh, technology life cycles. Now, when you come to the, you know, the challenges, yes, there are certain challenges you know, in development of you know, these collaborations. Number one is the industry and academic collaborations. We need to have a clear IP policy. The patenting laws should be very clear. The monetization aspects has to be very clear and crisp. And then, you know, the, the startup ecosystem, when you license it, then how those monetization has to share across the, you know, the, the stakeholders or the key players. That clarity has to be, you know, has to be brought in. As of now, there are some, you know, rules and regulations, but we need to revisit those things and we have to, you know, uh, bring, you know, more clarity and more transparency in this aspect. That is one challenge which I look at, you know, for this. And the second challenge is, uh, the cloud access and storage aspects. When you talk about the 25 innovation hubs, we require a background you know, type of a cloud access to all these innovation hubs so that the storage and computational aspects, that is partly addressed by the national supercomputing grid you know, that is being established as part of the government of India. That is again, DST and MIT is collaborating. So once that comes up, I think you know, partly it is already there, but it will, create a type of a platform, you know, the storage platform, computing platform for entire, you know, these 25 innovation and then the collaborative systems. Now, these are the, you know, the, the you know, initial thoughts I thought and I can share with all those people that uh, the DST is creating that unified technology platform for collaborations across the, you know, the academics, government and as well as industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murli. Uh, thank you for sharing the thoughts from the government perspective. Uh, yes, the 25 TIH, the Technology Innovation Hub, has been extremely uh, a role model kind of things what government has done in last year. So a uh, lot of expectation even industry has in that space. Uh, so with that uh, talk, uh, there are some questions and we are running yeah. out of time. So uh, shall I suggest to take two or three questions Why not? and sure. see if we can wrap up in, wrap up yes. in uh, next eight minutes or so. Yes. Uh, the first question is this, and maybe we'll start with Dr. Murli yourself and then uh, see if uh, Professor Ido or Dr. Alok has anything to add to that. The question is this, given the rising tide of trade protectionism, how do we create a global environment for data free trade as opposed to data protectionism? Very complex question. <laughs> Great. Very interesting also. Now, when you look at you know, the protectionism per se, normally we are referring it to the trade protectionism, where the business and as well as the market taxes or anti dumping, these type of issues are normally discussed. Now, we are referring it to particularly the data aspects. Now, there are two things here what I feel is one when you develop a technology or you know uh, uh, you know uh, data frameworks 
to address some of the international issues or humanitarian issues like you know climate change or if you talk about you know the uh, covid type of situations then normally this you know protectionism will not play much you know role in that countries come forward to share their data and address because it's a global issues now the other aspect is the business when the companies that try to develop a type of uh, products for commercial purposes yes the data sharing and as well as you know the you know, protectionism come into picture i look at this way when we have a valuable data the variable data you know there it becomes it that itself will become a type of a commodity so the once the data becomes a commodity the market drives the forces that's what i feel so the one is you know the global issues and the other one is the commercial issues so we have to look at it in a different different ways yeah i echo the same i think yeah. the international issues could be solved through collaborations and there shouldn't be such trade barrier but uh, in the commercial space uh, the way we have talked about data is oil and we have seen in the past over oil how much war has been fought uh, we have seen vaccines in the pandemic time we are talking data is water and water also people say it's a scarce product so i mean it's not going to be easy it has to be win win collaboration and bilateral uh, methods could work in certain cases between countries between companies between partners if it's a commercial application so we should not lose hope but i think a bottom up approach in those commercial cases is much better than a top down approach whereas in the uh, bigger causes obviously top down approach among governments among even bodies would be an ideal one sounds good uh, professor edo just wanted to check if you have something to add to that and i'm not uh, you know i i'm i'm in an academic environment you know not in a business environment Much, uh, sure. Uh, right in the in the academic environment, and it works pretty well. Um, but may, maybe an example that could be kind of a, an inspiring example that uh, we could uh, looking for for paths to to solve this problem or to advance data sharing is might be the example of open source, right? Open code. Um, if you look back, I don't know. Twenty years ago, right? Code was very private, not shared, and the code also used to be, you know, could be a, a kind of metaphor as oil or or uh, or uh, or water, uh, you know, that made the whole computing industry move. Uh, but still, some of the dynamics evolved uh, to a stage where today a lot of commercially valuable uh, software is open source, right? So. Uh, somehow uh, an ecosystem that sustains that has evolved so i'm not an expert to say uh, you know what the another another could be in data but maybe that model of open source started from academia but actually also uh, kind of prevailed into industry could inspire some thoughts on how similar things can be done with data makes sense and you know when uh, citizens benefit uh, governments benefit as well and so does economy so if we keep citizens focus in the center and make the decisions accordingly then the governments will benefit as would the economies of the country so thank you uh, for that um, the, for those inputs the second question uh, that's up is about the large and good data sets right uh, how can uh, and we can change the question based on whether it's industry or government but how could uh, let's say industry create large and good data sets for helping researcher communities to build ai models uh, which will have greater impact for society and uh, maybe we start with dr alok and then go with dr murli to see how government thinks in helping those uh, sharing those large uh, uh, non sensitive information available for researchers at large i think there are two kinds of data data also has a lifetime and uh, meaningful cases some are very real time then you know you are taking business decisions and some have become older in the context of industry uh, possibly it's not no more into the productization phase it's so important but it is still important from research angle and therefore 
uh, many of these uh, structural uh, database that will be available. Number two is each company, I mean, bigger companies or a consortium or partners, as we said, across countries, across these, they are forming smaller uh, focused groups. And if you keep your purpose ahead of data, meaning like as I was telling in the health clinic, if my goal is to help this, uh, the eye care centers and you know, all these challenged visually impaired people and we want to see you know, 250 million people are affected. If our purpose, whoever are joining are same, then some would be in the homogeneous data creation space, some would be in the heterogeneous creation space, but uh, if their mission is bigger, then I think this thing becomes successful. But if it is just a charity or we are donating somewhere, even if you get the data, that data is not very meaningful because data could be used in a context. It's not something, you know, it's like a currency that you get in one country of another country's currency and you have no clue what this means to others. I don't think it is meaningful. So the context has to be also kept in mind. Therefore, I think purpose first and the relevancy second. If we do that and governance policies, search big uh, queries, how to do that, usability, data inferencing, if you architect it right, I believe uh, then it could be very, very useful to do that. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, we are just about time. So any uh, closing comments? So I'll start with Dr. Murli, please. If you have any closing comments, please go ahead. Yeah, I have a small uh, closing comment. Uh, this, uh, when you talk about you know, the governmental intention, it is very clear when I mean, it brought you know, the national data sharing and accessibility policy. So in, the intention is to share the data. Okay, now, when you talk about the data, again, we have you know, two kinds of data, the legacy and as well as the dynamic data. So the legacy data has to go a lot of, you know, the creation aspects before it can really use it you know, by the digital systems, because most of them are in an analog form. So the other dynamic data, so that is also available, but we, we have a policy in place, the implementation, and overall, I think the government is willing to share the data. That's what I can say. So it is. Sounds good. Uh, Professor Edo, any final statement from your side? Um, I think a lot of the, the session kind of concerned with data. Um, I think it's important also to try and push beyond what is done today to kind of collaboration around different types of technology. Uh, I mean, we've definitely seen some examples, but I think more of that uh, should be done. People try to bring together people from different disciplines uh, because many of the problems we are facing uh, really require uh, highly multidisciplinary uh, kind of solutions. Yeah, sounds good. And Dr. Al Alok, your uh, points are well taken. Uh, would you like any other statement before yeah, we wrap up? Very there? simple. Data is data. We need insights and analytics, whether it is for developer, executives, consumers. So that's very, very important. Without that, it is not very meaningful. And we talked about data is oil, gold, water, but to me, it's like a library and it's becoming big library. So how do you architect? How do you search? You know, if you cannot find the right book in the library, it's kind of lost book, right? It's a misplaced book. So therefore, how do you search? How do you make sure that it is usable for your purpose? That's very, very vital. Uh, that'll be my concluding remark. Sounds good. And uh, for the benefit of the audience, uh, Dr. Murthy will be uh, sharing a, a update on the National Data Highway of MITI just right after this panel. It will take five minutes. So please uh, don't go away. Do stay for Dr. Murthy's five minutes overview on uh, National Data Highway. Uh, coming back uh, to the panel, I uh, agree that you know AI, while AI is affecting society worldwide, uh, from improving medical diagnostics to supply chains, uh, refining forecasting, and many other applications, government, academia, and leaders must work together for data strategies uh, that will generate improvements 
in upcoming technologies, create opportunities for the future, and be supported by a strong governance. With that, my sincere thanks to the organizers, Mighty, our host, Dr. Murthy, uh, our panelists, Professor Kaushik, Professor Ido, uh, Dr. Alok, and Dr. Murli. Thank you sir, so very much for adding value to this panel, uh, taking out time to participate in this event. Uh, have a great evening, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Dr. Murthy. Thank you very much, uh, Sumit, uh, for nice uh, coordination and moderation of the panel discussions. And thank you to all the uh, delegates and all the panelists also for a nice and fruitful discussion. So a lot of questions have come up on the data policy and data exchange and data uh, uh, sharing mechanisms. So hope you are all aware that we have announced the data uh, open API policy in 2015 in July. And based on that, we have created a data na uh, national data highway. So I would like to just make a presentation, a brief presentation of uh, five minutes on this, so that most of these questions are answered with this. And also it will provide an insight, in, insight for, uh, for private players also to play and how to share this. So, <clears throat> so this is what uh, my presentation talks about. Uh, This is National Digital Highway Open API Platform. It is an India Digital India Initiative. Quickly, while you are discussing the panel discussion, because of various questions, I pulled out of from my deck these slides and I wanted to present it so that it will answer many of these questions. So what are the challenges? Most of you are aware there are different ministries who are publishing these data and these data are actually in silos, but the users for that consumers will be central government, state government, universities, industries, a startup company, many of the players who are their business entities also want this data. So it is very difficult. There are no lack of any sharing of this data. All these data are to be anonymized and it is a heterogeneous data. So these databases are heterogeneous and various applications are there. So it is very complex process to combine all these into single database and then use it without uh, changing the identities of each, our, each and every application. So in order to avoid this, what we have done is we have created a little bit of API sharing instead of data sharing directly. That API will provide through a national data highway open platform. It provides a complete secure environment for these applications, which are databases of multiple and heterogeneous databases on different platforms to interact with various ministries and departments for the data sets that are available. So it is a single place where you can have a platform where you can col collaborate with all these people, all these data which are coming out and then do the applications while maintaining the Id identity of individual applications. So this, suppose the government and education and finance department, employment, health and all, they will be having some citizens data. This data in an anonymized form with a due authentication and due verification processes, this national data platform, national data highway, this platform will provide to the various applications. For example, identify of EKYC, or academic services like, for example, identification or verification of degrees or certificates issued by various universities and other educational institutions, or you have financial services for banking transaction or B2B or any other transactions that are there and health services regarding health, uh, health record, electronic health record or sharing of health record between two doctors or between two patients based on the uh, consent by the actual owner of the data. So immediate targets for API for transformation is data, data, data birth verification, address verification, driving license, PAN verification, vehicle registration and verification, DG, uh, RGA birth and uh, death certification verification, academic certification verification, skill certification verification, passport, EPIC and ration card, ba bank, and all these applications will conveniently use the single data platform using various databases which are there across the country using the single verification process and APIs that are being provided through this platform. So it can have the sector-wise benefits. You can have the education. You can verification of the educational certificates or financial 
online approvals for insurance claims or ekyc can be done or health health where consent based sharing of electronic health records or backbone of telemedicine ecosystem also can be created through this transport application verification of vehicle and vehicle where driver details or online insurance for this purpose or personal uh, presence less services such as renewal of the license or uh, the fitness or payment of penalty all these things can be done at, uh, online so ease of coding of business and government services delivery startup ecosystem can you can also some of the business entities can use this data and then do some and serve to various business entities also and develop a low cost solution for credit worthies and also micro credit micro financing also is possible api based ration card systems and insurance sector and land records all these applications these sectors can get benefit by this policy of national open policy so what is the proposed open api governance structure it has an interministerial governance group headed by our secretary mighty and technical experts will be there advisory committee and api cell will be there in mighty or digital india corporation platform management and schema and body and the compliance body will be there and each one will have its own functions and quality resolutions also will be there so finally just to conclude current status of this is administrative approval has been issued in march 2020 platform is now operational at openapi.gov.in you can note down the url implementation guidelines are prepared strong data sharing access policy support and interministerial governance structure is proposed already domain specific xml data standardization done for education transport income uh, caste and birth certificates as a proof of concept or as a pilot projects open api 3.5 3.0 compliance is in progress so you can have already seen 9 9.150 publications publishers are already on onboarded over 600 api users are also on platform and around 33 lakhs are being uh, records are being done by september 2020 so this is the current status of this thank you very much so now we will have a two so we will have now two videos uh, by intel on neuro computing platform mike davis is there or uh, someone will be playing the videos thank you dr murthy for yeah, sharing yeah, this yeah, yeah. any questions for The basic idea of neuromorphic computing is to create a chip that emulates the human brain. We're rethinking computing itself from the bottom up by applying the latest understanding from neuroscience to computer architecture. If you look at the conventional CPU, it operates in a dramatically different way from the way the actual brain works. About 99% of all chips are designed with a clock. This is what's called synchronous design methodology. It's continually reading a rigid sequential instruction set. Asynchronous design is a completely different way of designing chips that doesn't use a clock. It's inspired more directly from how the brain works. With neuromorphic chips, we're creating a huge parallel sea of neurons where each one operates without any prescribed order. My team came from a startup that Intel acquired applying research relating to asynchronous design. We have software developers, chip designers, architects, algorithms researchers that come from diverse backgrounds like physics and biology, even chemistry. Loihi is the world's most advanced neuromorphic chip. It has scalability built right into it, so we can chain together this neural fabric Over time, we'll see Intel's neuromorphic chips deployed in a wider range of real-world applications. Smart factories, adaptive, faster manufacturing, human-computer interfacing through gestures, processing speech, olfaction, and vision. We have the freedom within Intel Labs to explore these exotic new ideas. 
How humans come up with creative insights is not understood in conventional computing. We must draw inspiration from how our human intelligence guides us and explores different possibilities. We're making progress. Thank you, uh, distinguished delegates and, and as panelists and speakers. We have come to the conclusion of this uh, wonderful discussion of our collaboration data-driven research for, and, uh, and so we have discussed in this uh, session, data-driven uh, research and data sharing, open data mechanisms, and how this data collabor collaboration can be ha happen for, uh, Data, data director research. So thank you very much for and good night to all. Have, have stay home and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Sumit. And thanks. We are saying bye-bye.